it was uh, last summer, and uh, it was August, and I looked at my wife. I said, honey, I sure would like to do something for our anniversary. And um, she said, what do you want to do? I said, I've always wanted to go deep sea fishing. I said, we're going to be training the uh, uh, St. Mary's congregation right on the east coast of Georgia. I said, why don't we go a day early, and we'll go deep sea fishing? She said, great. So I called the church. I said, brethren, who, who, who's the best deep sea fisherman around? Well, they gave me a number. I called him. He said, yeah, I've got, I've got an opening. He said, I'll be glad to take it. And I said, I said, great. I said, what time should I be there? He said, 3 o'clock. And I said, 3 o'clock? I said, uh, I said, uh, I said man, I, 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 I said, well, well, it doesn't leave us a lot of time. He said, 3 in the morning. <laughs> he said, um, I said, all right. I said, how in the world am I going to tell my wife to get up at 3? Okay, I said, we got up there. And I said, sir, how do I know it's you? He said, I'll be the only one there. <laughs> and... Um, so um, we get out there and get in the boat. It's him, his first mate. It was my family and my dad, five of us. And uh, we get in the boat, and he says, he's all right, go to sleep. So I get in the boat, and we went to sleep. We, we went for hours. And we're going way, I, want, I, want the, I told him I want the big ones. So we get way out there, you know. He wakes us up. He said, everybody get up. So we get up. He says, time to get bait. And I said, bait? He says, yeah, you're fishing for it. So we, we got, our, we got our, our lines out there, multiple hooks on them, you know. We put our lines out there, and he said, all right, you, everybody get ready. Now everybody, he started doing a countdown. He says, five, four, three, two, one. Reel them in. And we were, they were covered in bait. I couldn't, I've never seen anything like it. The man knew exactly where the fish were. I said, this guy is good. We, we unhooked all the fish, put them in the live way. He said, he said go back to bed. So we got back in the, you know, kind of crawled back into our seats, went to sleep. We went out another hour. And he said, he said, all right, everybody, here we are. He said, who wants to go first? I said, I will. And he, and he, uh, he kind of hooked me in, you know. I mean, he put the stuff on me. I said, man, this, this must be some big fish, you know. So he's hooking me in and getting me ready and strapping me in, you know. He said, he puts the, he puts the, the, the bait on the, the line, and we throw out the line, the line. And he says, all right, you ready? I said, yeah. He said, be ready. He says, 10. He counted down again. Nine, three, two, one. He said, there it is. And he said, hook it. And I, it was amazing. He knew exactly. And I started bringing that thing in. I don't know what it was, a barracuda or something. I don't know what the thing was. I, I'm bringing it in, you know. It's huge. It's, man, it's coming in the boat. He had everything he needed for us to accomplish our mission. He had the hooks, the swivels, the bait, the line, the boat, the knowledge, the strategy. He came prepared. He knew exactly how to fish for fish. He's good at it. I think we have some men in our pews tonight. You're more equipped to take me catfishing than we are to go fishing for men. You know why? Because you have spent your life learning how to do it. You've read every magazine, you've watched every YouTube video, you bought all the equipment, and you know what the problem most of us have tonight? We have no tackle box. In fact, how many of you tonight have a tackle box? Anybody have a tackle box anywhere? Uh, you could get access to a tackle. You know, most of us somewhere in our attic, barn, garage, got a tackle box grandpa gave us. And it's full of stuff. I remember the first tackle box I got was from my, my grandfather. I opened it up, and it, I still got the stuff in there. I, mean, I don't even know what some of it does. But I'm prepared to go fishing. What's in your tackle box tonight? Are you prepared? Have you studied? Have you, have you focused as much energy on winning souls as we have getting catfish and barracuda and whatever it is? All the time you spent trying to survey out the big buck, you know? You go out there and you get your night vision cameras and you get, you hook it. Now we hook it up to the Wi Fi. Man, we get the pictures taken up. We know exactly what time. We got the deer feeders hooked up. We got the scent. We got the camouflage. We got the, we got the caliper bullet, the gun. We got it all. That poor deer don't have a prayer. Don't you worry, we're prepared. We got men in our pews who are more prepared to get the big buck than they are ever to get a soul. Would you advance the slide for me? I was sitting behind the uh, pulpit, and, and I was getting ready on Sunday morning, and uh, this man, he walked right down the aisle. His wife was with him, and I saw him coming. When he got to me, he looked at me, and he said, Hey, uh, he said, Preacher. He said, Are you the preacher here? I said, Yes, sir. His name's Rob Whitaker. He says, Name's Richard Pratt, my wife Daisy. I said, Nice to meet you. He said, uh, You guys just preached the Bible here? I said, huh? 
He says, sir, that's all we preach. He says, good. He said, the church I left last week stopped doing it years ago. He says, and I'll be listening to you this morning. I said, that's, that's a pretty fast. I said, sir, you listen on. Take notes. And he did. Him and his wife sat down in those pews, and I started my Bible class, and they took every note, every scripture I said. They wrote it down. She's got her nose buried in the Bible. She's writing things down. We go through the sermon, same thing. I mean, they're just completely focused on the message. People are going up to him and greeting him, you know. My name is? Well, it's my turn now. I walked right up to him after the service. I said, Richard, Daisy, got a question for you. They said, yes, sir, preacher. I said, did I just preach the Bible? And she said, man, that's all you preach. I haven't heard that much preaching in years. And uh, I said, uh, I said, how would you guys like to go? Uh, how would you guys like to go out to eat, get a bite, just just visit? And he said, well, we'd love to do that. I said, okay. I said, yeah, always eat. We took him out to eat and sat down around the table and just got to know him a little bit. And, you know, talking to him. I said, Richard, would you like to know more about the church here? He said, I sure would. I said, I, I tell you, what, how, how about we meet tomorrow? And we set the appointment. We sat around the table like we always do, passed out back to the Bible, book one. Man, they're great. They know their books of the Bible. They, they have no problem finding the, 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 the various scriptures, verses. They're reading it. They're filling out the book. I mean, you could just tell they love it. At the end of the study, Richard looks at me and said, Preacher, he says, I'm sold. Sign me up. Sign you up? He said, yeah, where do I sign? I said, Richard, there's no signing here. He said, well, Richard, pre Preacher, I'm ready. He said, you've proven me. This church just preaches the Bible. He said, I've been looking for this church for years. And um, I said, uh, Richard, um, I think you need another study. Preacher, did you not listen to me? I've sold. He said, I'm ready. Just, just where's the paperwork? Paperwork? I said, Richard, uh, you need to come back for another study. He said, okay. He said, we'll come back for another study. If you think we need, I think you do. So they came back for the second study. So we sat down at the table, opened up the blue booklet. We did it. They're filling it out. And I didn't know, I didn't know you're supposed to take the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week. I didn't know. I didn't know you're, you know, I didn't know you're supposed to have elders and they didn't know anything about. We got through with the second study. Richard is so excited for what he's learned. He pulls his checkbook out. He said, he said, preacher, he says, I'm sold. How much is this going to cost me? Cost you? He said, how much money do you need? Money. I said, no, no money here, Richard. He said, shoo. He said, in the last church, if I missed a Sunday, they'd send me a bill. A bill. I said, no, Richard. I said, here. I said, I said, I'll tell you what, Richard, we're going to do another, another study. He said, am I that bad a sinner that I need another study? I said, no, Richard. I said, there's, one, there's something you don't know yet. He said, if you think so, preacher. So he went back. He's a logger. He sells, he sells timber at uh, logs at the local sawmill, Clark Lumber Company. And uh, he, he goes down to the local uh, uh, sales office. Joe Lynn, one of the elders, he, he's actually a sales clerk. He walks into Joe Lynn's office. And says, he says, he says, Joe Lynn, I got a bone to pick with you. That little preacher back there won't let me join your church. He said, what? Richard, what are you talking about? Your preacher, he won't let me join. Richard, what did he tell you to do? He said, I need to do a Bible study. He said, then that's exactly what you need to do. Um, Richard and Daisy showed up that night, and we did book three. Richard got it. He looked across the table and he said, Rob, I can't join your church, can I? He said, no, you can't, Richard. He said, Rob, you don't even have a church, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, Rob, uh, would you baptize Daisy and I? He said, we'd like to be added to this church. We'd like to be Christians. I said, I can do it now. And we did. Richard and Daisy have become some of our closest friends. It's amazing what happens when you study the Bible. Your, your, your family and friend list is just going to grow. Every Christmas and Thanksgiving, we invite the new converts into our home and we share, uh, we share with the most precious uh, memories of life. Brethren, if you're not doing Bible studies, if you're not sitting down around tables and opening your Bible and, and teaching people the Word of God, you're literally missing out on the greatest blessing God can give you this side of eternity. And I hope I can share that with you tonight. I'm convinced the biggest mistake we're making in personal evangelism is a lack of personal Bible study. Brethren, we are not studying the Bible. We're having good talks with people. We love to talk to people about the church. We love to talk to them about Jesus, but we're not studying with them about Jesus. Until we study with people about Jesus, we're never going to be able to see the conversions that you find in the New Testament. You see, it's, it's, it's quite often that I'll, I'll find people that will want to, uh, they'll want to know, they want to know more about evangelism. I started to get phone calls from elders 
They call me like a church woman, like Nashville will call me and they say, hey, hey, preacher, what are you guys doing out there? How are you guys growing like this? Can we talk to you? And I actually meet with elders. I meet with preachers. And they, they start to ask me to do these seminars and lessons. And I had this one eldership and they were from uh, somewhere in middle Tennessee. I don't want to name the church. They said, preacher, could, could we come and can just meet with you, find out kind of what you guys are doing here at Willette? I said, sure. So the day of the meeting, um, some serious storms were going through Middle Tennessee, dangerous tornadoes. And they called me and they said, Rob, we, we can't come today. I said, I, I, I understand. Can we do a phone conference with you? I said, sure, phone conference is fine. So we got all the elders on the phone, the preacher, and we're, we're having this conversation. And uh, they said, now, preacher, we just want you to explain to us, what are you guys doing? Well, what, what, what are you guys doing? How are you growing like this? And I said, well, I'll tell you what it's called. It's called personal Bible studies. Well, well, preacher, slow down. What did you call it? I said, personal Bible studies. Hey, uh, uh, here's what we do. My wife and I invite people. Now, preacher, hang on now. You called it personal what? I said, personal Bible studies. My wife and I invite people to our house. We usually eat with them. We pass out these booklets called Back to the Bible. Now, preacher, hey, where do you get these people from? I said, oh, well, um, uh, Let's see, um, you work with them. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they, they probably sit in your pews. They're probably your next door neighbor. Now, preacher, uh, now wait, pr preach, preach, where do you get them from again? I said, um, hey, have you guys ever used house to house, heart to heart? I baptize three or four people a year. What? A house to house, heart? Oh, you mean that publication? Yeah, we, we sent that out one time. Someone got offended and we quit. I said, okay. Um, Hey, preacher, yes, sir, have you guys ever done the big VBS at Willette to get all the kids to come? I said, the big what? The big VBS. I said, I don't even know what the big VBS is. He said, I said, what is that? He said, you, 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 you rent the blow-up toys and the rides and, 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 and on the bouncy houses. You need to fill the parking lot and, and, and everybody comes. It's an exciting time for the church. I said, um, no, sir, we've never done the big VBS. Oh. Now, preacher, explain to us again, what is it that you do there at that church to, to get? I said, it's called personal Bible study. My wife and I invite people to our house. Now, we sit around a table. She cooks a meal, and we're going to do a Bible. Hello? H Hello? Brethren, I pray God it was the storms. Are they hung up on me? I tried for 30 minutes to convince an eldership that you grow churches by doing Bible studies and getting all the members involved and I couldn't do it. I was so, I was so irritated at that phone call. I mean, I, I, I can tell you, I was, I, was, I was at my wit's end because I tried every angle I could to convince an eldership that the church needs to be trained how to do Bible study, and I completely failed. I called my wife. I said, Nicole, I said, i got to tell you what just happened. I said, I've never seen anything like this, ever. I said, I had an eldership show up and uh, called me on the phone. And I explained it. I said, so I said, write this down with me. I never want to forget it. When I got off the phone with her, I said, I I've got to figure out what's going on. So I want to show you what I did. I Googled churches of Christ. But I want to share with you what I found. Do you know in our pews right now, we literally have children that have grown up and they have never seen their father do a Bible study. They have never seen their mother do a Bible study. We literally have children who've grown up and are having children and we don't even know what a Bible study looks like anymore. Here's what I found. The Church of Christ, we are well able to deal with any problem out there. Let me, let me tell you about all the ministries I found. I click, I just click, I click. I said, I, said, I want to know what this church is doing. So I, here's what I found. Just about every Church of Christ has a youth ministry. I'm not opposed to youth ministries. I think we should minister to the youth. I love that the young people, you know, there's a lot of seminars I come to, guys, and there's not a young person there. Thank God you're here tonight. I love youth ministry. We have teen ministries, special ministries, just for the teens, you know. We got, we got lock-ins, we got, we got Bible camps, and we got summer youth series, and we, we got raft trips and all sorts of neat things. We, and then we got the single ministry. The single, pro everybody's got the single program. And, you know, that, that's for those who've got, yet got married, but we can kind of hook you up, you know. And then we got the, of course, we got the married ministry. If you're married, you need a ministry. Don't worry, 
wise, we can help you with your husbands. We know he's difficult. We'll rough, we'll sand off his rough edges. Don't you worry. We, we're the place. And, and then, of course, occasionally you have the divorce. Hey, if you're going through divorce, come to the church of Christ. We're going to help you. We'll guide you with the Bible. Then we got the parenting ministry. It's hard to raise children today. Parents, we've got a ministry for you. We can, we got a program that will help you just, then we've got the addiction program. Listen, if you're addicted, don't you worry, come to this church. We'll help you get off of it. And what you need is the word of God. And we got the depression program. If you're depressed, you come to the church of Christ and we'll, we'll counsel with you. We'll show you the great physician, the wonderful, the counselor. And we'll help you with it. And then we got the silver wings program. When you get a little older, the silver wings, don't you worry. We still love you. Well, we've got things for you to do in the church. Your time. And then when you get really up there, you, we got the golden oldies program. we got Bible bingo every Friday night. The Church of Christ has more programs than any religion out there, I'm telling you. I could not believe what I found. But more troubling was that, I could not believe what I didn't find. I want to know where the Church of Christ is that has an evangelism program. Where is the Church of Christ that makes it their mission to train their church members how to do Bible studies? Brethren, I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. I'm sure it's there somewhere. I was sitting in my easy chair, and uh, Nicole said, hey, Rob. She said, someone's talking to you about you on Facebook. I said, really? What are they saying? She said, she started reading it. Brethren, if I named the preacher, you'd know him. He said, there's this preacher out there going around churches, scaring people. He's telling people we're losing church members. He's saying we're dying. Don't believe him. I said, well, read on. I said, maybe he, he's got information I don't have. I, brethren, I'd love to be wrong. I'd love that everything I said about the numbers in the church of Christ was wrong. I wish to God it were wrong. You know what he said? He said, we're not dying. He said, we're growing. He said, look at Paul seeing the pulpit. We had 5,000. He said, look at lads to leaders. We had a 10,000. You, you, the, the, you look at the youth pigeon forage retreat. We had a 20,000. He said, we're not a dying, we're a growing. Do you know what the problem is with all those numbers? Brethren, those are inward numbers. They have nothing to do with kingdom growth. We're counting our own people. I think it's high past time we started to teach our brethren how to go fishing for men. We are experts at keeping the aquarium. We know exactly how to do it, but we have lost the knack. We used to be the best at it. And I want to share with you tonight something that I hope will, will just change the way you, you look at it. I'm going to begin with this. How many Bible studies have you had in the last five years? I want you to start thinking. Oh, preacher, I knew you were going to try to shame me. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying, I, I, want, I want you to learn from this. I want to know in the last five years how many Bible studies have you had with a sinner. He said, oh, preacher, now I, 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 I'll tell you what. Last night, um, preacher, I, I was on Facebook, and i got to tell you what happened. And, I, and, and then someone said, now, preacher, last night I went to the break room. It was, it was during work. And um, I, I thought, I'd bring my Bible. And I got my Bible out, and I got out of Mark 16, 16. I told my friend, I said, I want you to listen to this verse. He that believes and is baptized. Shall be. And I read Mark. Well, he got his Bible out, you know. He opened up to John 3, 16, and he read it to me. And then I said, well, man, I'm gonna, I read Mark 16, 16, right? He that believes and is baptized. Shall be. And he read, God so loved the world. And I read my, he read. And man, they started to pile in, you know, one, one on one side. One. It was a wonderful Bible. Brother, you should have seen the brawl in the break room. And then there's a old sister Susie. I go to the tea room every Monday afternoon, Rob, with my friends in the community, and we're doing a gospel meeting, and I invited all of them to come. And there's Techie Tom. Now, Rob, last night on the Facebook, I, I decided I needed to do a Bible study. So I wrote down on my, my Facebook message, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. My church is in the Bible. Where's yours? He said, Rob, you should have seen this, the thread, all the, all the various comments I was getting. It was a wonderful Bible study. Do you know what the problem is with all of that? Brethren, none of that is a Bible study. None. I'm asking you, in the last five years, how many times have you sat around a table and you've opened a Bible and you've done a Bible study with somebody? I'm giving you over 1,600 days. I think it's time we put the Bible into Bible study. Open your guidebook and turn it to the notes section. We're going to take notes. 
go to the end. I'm going to give you three things to write down. I'm going to show you where I found them. I was sitting listening to Luke 10. Jack Honeycutt was the preacher. And Jack said, turn to Luke chapter 10. And I turned to Luke chapter 10. And I, as he was teaching, I, I, started, I started to realize there's something I'm missing. He started talking about Jesus and the Bible studies of Jesus. And, and, and as I, I was listening, I said, there's something that Jesus did that, that I've never done this before. Do you know what Jesus did? He deferred. He deferred. He didn't debate people. He, he, he didn't go around answering their questions. When Jesus was asked a question, he always deferred it. Jesus never gave ground. People come, Jesus, I want to know this. I want you to study the life of Christ and notice that Jesus always deferred. He wasn't there to debate them. I'm not talking about public debates. I'm talking about private back and forth discussion. Jesus did not do that. He didn't chase rabbits. He didn't play 20 questions. He didn't play Bible trivia. Jesus was not there to answer all their questions. Friends, write this down. He who asks the questions controls the study. Jesus is not going to give up the field. Jesus is not going to let someone run him around the field. If you're a rabbit hunter, rule number one is don't chase it. Or you'll never shoot it. Stand still. What we do, what we do as Christians, we answer all their questions. I had a preacher come up to me just recently. He said, now, Rob, I'm just here to kind of polish up on my evangelism. He said, but my theory is we need to answer all their questions up front. He says, what do you think about it? I said, ask me that question when I'm finished with the seminar. When I was finished with the seminar, he walked up. He says, that's not how Jesus did it, was it? I said, no, he never did that. He baptized six people in three weeks. Brethren, this works. I'm going to show you why you should defer. You defer every question they ask for two reasons. Number one, they're not asking the right question. And number two, even if they are, they're not ready for it. Brother, most of the questions you're asked are the, a terrible place to begin a study. Who wants to start a Bible study on instrumental music? Who wants to start a Bible study on tongue speaking? Is that really where you want to start a discussion with a sinner? Absolutely not. And number two, even if that's where you're going to begin, I guarantee they're not ready for it. They don't even understand the language you're using. Jesus said in John 16, 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. You're not ready for them. Do you know who he said this to? Friends, Jesus said this to his own disciples. If the disciples were not ready, do you think the sinner is going to be? I'm sitting in the living room. Sheila looks over at me. And she says, now, Rob, she says, I understand at your church, you don't believe in music. Why? You don't believe in instrumental music. Why? Brother, I can tell you the old Rob, I would, have, I, I would have taken that question, I'd have parsed every comma, I'd have parsed every, every, every a word and every letter. I am fully equipped to deal with that question. I know the Greek word, I know a little bit of Hebrew, I know the arguments on both sides, I have studied it backwards and forwards. If we want to go and have a debate on instrumental music, I'm ready. That is the last thing she knew. When Sheila asked me that question, I'll tell you exactly what I did, because I'd rehearsed it in my office. I said, Sheila, that is a great question. I said, I said uh, you guys have music in the church? She said, yeah. I said, uh, what kind of music do you got? I said, you got a piano? She said, oh, yes, and so-and-so. I said, I, I said, how long has she played it? Oh, for 20-some years. I said, hey, Sheila, do you ever play Amazing Grace? Oh, yes, I love Amazing Grace. I said, you play Nothing But the Blood? Oh, I love Nothing But the Blood. I said, it's wonderful. I said, you like to praise God with I'm not answering. If I answer that question, the Bible study is over. Take your Bible to Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, I, I saw some things here that I, I wish I'd seen it years ago. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus has a Bible study, and there's this, uh, there's this lawyer. And um, evidently, they called him in, you know, the ringer. He, he, he's called in to show up Jesus. Because the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they've been put down time and time again. And, and, and they bring in this lawyer. This is not a, a modern-day lawyer. You've got to understand, this guy, he's an expert in the law of Moses. He knows the law inside and out, and he knows where the loopholes are. And, and he's a loophole finder. And they, go, and they literally go to this man and say, listen, we got this problem in the old law. How do we get around it? He tell them. You know, so they, this guy knows the, the old law 
uh, you know, as, as good as you know the English language. And so they bring him in, and his whole purpose is to trick Jesus. It's always there for her. Watch this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. That's all he wanted to do. Saying, Master, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Brethren, if there was ever a question that deserved to be answered, it's that one. And do you know what the Lord did? He did not answer. The Lord is not there to answer people's questions. The Lord is there to ask them. Brethren, our Lord deferred. He deferred one of the greatest questions in life. He's not going to go back and forth with this man. He's not going to play Bible trivia. If the Lord wanted to put this lawyer in his place and show him how ignorant he was, he could have done it. But he didn't. Can I tell you about what my problem was in evangelism? I was more interested in winning the debate. But I kept losing the soul. What good does it do to win the argument? What good does it do to show that your, your religious neighbor that you know more about the Bible than they do? What good does it do to show them that you, you got all the winnings, you're on the winning side, they don't know what they're talking about? Absolutely nothing. Look how consistent he is. Watch this. We're going to go through a few examples. Matthew 21. Take your Bible. And just, just go through every example of the Lord being asked questions and look how he responds. He does the same thing every time. Matthew 20, he doesn't answer. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 23 through 27, here it is. And when he was come into the temple, and the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching them, and they said, Jesus, by what authority doest thou these things? Who gave you this authority? If there's ever a question that I'd want to answer, it'd be that one. Brother, that's my question. Do you know what the Lord did? The Lord said, um, I'll tell you what, I also will ask you one thing, huh? Jesus, would you just answer the question? No, I'm not. He said, I'll do the question. He says, um, and, and I, if you, I'll ask you this one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Um, was it from heaven or men? Well, and they began to reason among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? Well, we say of men, well, we fear the people. They all hold John as a prophet. And they said, Jesus, we cannot tell you. Jesus said, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus was not there to answer questions, was he? Look at Matthew 10, 17. Here's, our, here's a rich young ruler. He comes running, and, he, and he, when he gets to him, he kneels to him on the ground and says, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, um, hey, why'd you call me good? Jesus, the man just asked you what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Tell the man, Jesus. No. He who asks the question controls the study. I ask the question. Why'd you call me good? Jesus deferred. Jesus was not going to get into a back and forth. Jesus was not going to sit there and play 20 questions. Jesus was not there to prove that he knew more about the Bible than they did. That is not the strategy Jesus took, but it's the strategy that I took for years. Not anymore. Number two, write this down. Show, don't tell. Don't tell them. I know you're tempted to quote Mark 16, 16. Don't do it. I know you're tempted to quote Acts 2, 38. Resist. I know you're tempted to quote Ephesians 5, 19 and point out the verbs. Don't do it. You show. I was sitting in the the living room, and Sheila and Jackie were talking with me, and Sheila was asking me all these questions. I deferred every one of them. And she looked at me, and she said, Now, Rob, she says, I tell you what. She says, um, I heard that you guys in the Church of Christ believe you're the only ones going to heaven. I knew that was coming. If you're not prepared for that one, you're not alive, because you're going to get asked that. And I knew it. And when she asked that question, I had, I've already rehearsed it. I said, Sheila, I said, great question. I said, can I ask you who told you that? She said, well, I don't know. I've always heard it. I said, well, Sheila, I said, I said that's a question that deserves an answer. I said, do, do you mind if we would take a, a, a little bit of time and I showed you the answer? She said, show me. I said, yeah, like, like open a Bible. You mean like a Bible study? I said, well, Sheila, you call it whatever you want to. Jackie, can we do a Bible study with a preacher for the Church of Christ? Now, Sheila, I don't think it's ever wrong to study your Bible. Brethren, do not tell them the answer. You've got to get him into this book. 
Look at Luke 10. We're back right to the Bible study. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice what Jesus did. Jesus said, what is written? What do you mean what's written? Jesus just quoted. No, he said, what's written? Jesus wanted them to read the word of God. Brethren, if you want to convert somebody, you've got to get them into this book. People need to read their Bibles. Now look at this. How readest thou? They have got to read. You have got to get them into the text, and they've got to come face to face and eye to eye with the word of God. Friends, they'll be glad to argue with you as long as you live. It's hard to tell God no. You look into the eyes of God, and you let his word do the teaching. Because I can tell you no the rest of my life. But it's not about you anymore. You see, when they read their Bible, it's about them and God. And when they read what God said, now they've got to deal with it. They can, you can quote it all you want, but we've got to get people into this book. Brethren, this book has the power to break down the thickest of religious errors. If you want to see someone overcome whatever obstacle in the way to their salvation, you've got to get them to the book as fast as you can. The quicker you get out of the way, the better. We don't need your gift of gab. You do not have to have some special personality to convert people. What you need to do is get into the Bible and let them read the words of God. The Bible says, by the words of the Lord were the heavens formed, by the very breath of his mouth. If God can create the world by his word, what can he do with a sinner? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to save. We need people in the gospel I need people to read the very words of Jesus. I don't want to quote Mark 16, 16. I want them to read it. I want them to read it with their own eyes. There's something that happens to a person when they read the word of God. No one could have said it better than Scarlett. Hey, Rob, when I became a Christian, she said, my life changed forever. She said, my friends were relentless with me. She said, Rob, they, they kept asking, you know, Scarlett, why'd you do this? Why'd you leave us, Scarlett? We grew up in this church, and Scarlett, why? Scarlett, your grandmother goes to this church. Why would you leave this church when your grandmother goes here? Scarlett, Scarlett, your brother goes here. Your mama goes here. Your daddy goes here. Scarlett, all your family. Why? Scarlett, if you're going to leave, be a Methodist. Be, be a Lutheran, not a member of the church of Christ, Scarlett. I mean, Scarlett, all places, don't go there. She said, Rob, I'd had it up to here. She said, my best friend was in my room. We were sitting there talking, and she finally said, she said, Scarlett, I don't get it. Why did you do it? I looked her straight in the eyes. Do you really want to know? Because if you know what I know, you'll do what I did. She said, Rob, I had no choice. It was what the Bible said. She said, Rob, when I read the Bible, I couldn't argue with it. I could argue with William all day long. She could, I could argue with your preachers all day long. She said, but when I read the word of God, I had no choice but to obey. Sounds a lot like her daddy. Sheila, we have no choice. It's what the Bible says. Through thy precepts I gain understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Brother, we've got to get people into this book. You've got to understand the conversion doesn't happen because of you. It happens because of this book. We've got to get them to read it. And when they read it, amazing things happen when you get the word in their heart and it dwells in them. It eats at them. It breaks down barriers. It breaks down tradition. It breaks, it breaks through all the, all the obstacles. Get them into the scripture. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the hearts. Number three, last point tonight. You got to learn to plant. Brother, we got to learn the lesson we learned in Bible class. We got to be planters again. But now, how many of you grew up in the Church of Christ? Raise hands. How many grew up in the Church of Christ? How many of you went to Bible class? And you remember having a teacher? We were just in, we were just in Hatler's Chapel, Tennessee, Martin, Tennessee. And, uh, and uh, we got there, and uh, uh, we, we kind of walked through the church building. We were the only ones there. And I, I went into a Bible class. You know what was on the, you know what was on the um, window seal? Cups. And what was inside the cups? Seeds, dirt. You know what they were doing? 
I remember it. You ever go to school and have the teacher give you the little bean seed, you put the dirt in the cup, put the water in the cup, and you know, they, they give you the lesson about Luke 8. You know, this is the parable, the seed is the word of God, where Luke 8, 15 says, but on the good ground are they which of an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Brethren, it is one of the most basic lessons Christ taught, and we don't practice it. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, let me share with you what it looks like in real life. Behold, a certain lawyer, he's not there. He's not there to be converted, brethren. He's there to get Jesus. He stood up, and all he wants to do is take Jesus down. And the Bible says he tempted him. He looked at Jesus, and he tempted the Lord. And the Bible says, but he willing to justify himself. All he wanted to do was look good. All he wanted to do was, was to show up Jesus. And the Bible says, Jesus looked at that man. You know what he did with him? He tried to save his soul. He said, who is my neighbor? He preached to that man who was dishonest of heart, one of the greatest parables ever recorded in Scripture, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know what Jesus was? He was a planner. It didn't matter who it was. Jesus was always trying to plant the word, and we don't. I'll prove it to you. I got a phone call from an eldership and. And uh, it was in East Tennessee, large congregation. Preacher, we've been hearing about you guys growing over there in the middle of nowhere. That's Willette. Would you come help us? I said, sure. So I, got, I, I, I was working with the young people there at Willette. We had a good youth group. And I said, I'll tell you what, why don't we grab some young people and parents, and we'll go and do some door knocking. I said, we can, and we'll show them how to do some evangelism. So we, 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 uh, we went there for about four or five days. And I got to the church building, and when I arrived, the elders and the deacons were there, and they were in the church office. I, I walked in, and they got out the map. It was wonderful. I love maps. They were organized, and they had a quadrant off, quadrant one, two, three, four. And in quadrant four, there was an X. And they said, now, preacher, here's what we're going to do. They said, now, we're going to send you into quadrant one. Now, there's some really good prospects in quadrant one, and we're going to focus all of our... Yes, preacher. Uh, sir, why is there an X in quadrant four? He said, well... Preacher, we're going to send you over here in quadrant Not good candidates for the gospel there. Now, in quadrant one, good candidates. Now, we want to send you over there. Now, preacher, we think those are the kind of people we're looking for. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, preacher. Uh, uh, preacher, uh, sir, I want you to send me to quadrant number four. Preacher, did you not listen? Why in the world would you want to go to quadrant number four? I told you, there are not good candidates for the gospel there. I said, because if Jesus was standing here, that's exactly where he'd go. You know what we're experts at? I'll tell you. We're experts at eliminating people. Here's how it works. Now, preacher, you better not go over there. Because over there, there are two women living together. You know what that might mean. They're probably not good candidates there. And preacher, you stay away from that house every Friday night, preacher. Every Friday night, he's got a beer party going on all weekend long. He don't want the gospel. Now, preacher over there, real religious. He is the preacher of the Methodist church. Been doing that for 30 years. Don't waste your time. Now, preacher, that guy over there, Last time I knocked on his door, he slammed it, used a four-letter word with me. There are a bunch of young people over there. They don't really care about the God. Now, I work with that guy. Now, don't ruin my relationship with him now, preacher. Brethren, when we're done eliminating everybody, there's no one left to teach. And we're good at it. You know why you don't have a list of people to study with? Because you've eliminated every person you know. You've already said, can't get to them. Tried that 10 years ago. They go to this church. They're not interested. They, they, I, I'm not so certain about their marriage over there, preacher. Better not even try over there. Brother, who gave us the right to choose who's a good candidate for the gospel? Have we forgotten the lesson we learned at Bible class? Brethren, we are to be planters. Jesus was not in the picking business. He was in the planting business. And I would suggest tonight that we need to plant the word of God to every person we know. And you never believe what might happen. Well, that's uh, kind of sparse. And uh, there's a church building, and across the street from the church building is an old school shut down. Then there's an old, old restaurant from the early 1900s, old brick building. People had opened it up for the farmers. They'd feed them breakfast, lunch. Now, I never got to eat breakfast. I'll tell you why. Preachers don't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. At least this one doesn't. And when a farmer, 
You don't get to eat if you're not up at 5 o'clock in the morning. By 7 o'clock, it's gone. So I never got breakfast, but I never missed lunch. So my children would go to the church building every day. My, my wife and I raised Jared and Hannah in a church building. And uh, she'd work on Bible class, homeschool them and whatever. And, and, and about 11 o'clock, my kids would run into my office. Dad, 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 it's 11 o'clock. We've got to go get lunch. You know what that means? The farmers are on their way. By 1130, it's gone. So we walked across the street. I know them. I see them just about every day. There's a guy sitting in the corner. Don't know him. And... Oh, there he comes, that Campbellite. Here comes that preacher for the church of Christ. I said, come on in here, Campbellite. Come on in here, you waterlogged. Hey, come on in, here. the Campbellite's here, everybody, today. The old Rob would have loved to come up to him and tell him exactly what a Campbellite is. Not anymore. I have one mission. All I want is a Bible study with the man. I just walk up to him and said, sir, what's your name? Name's Bill. Bill, nice to meet you. I see that, that little family right there. That's my wife, best cook in Macon County. I said, her cooking's unbelievable. She's taught her, our daughter how to be a dessert maker. Whew, good stuff, Bill. I said, Bill, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you tonight. You're coming to my house. My wife's going to cook for you a meal. And i tell you what, how about roast beef, mashed potatoes and gravy, corn on the cob, biscuits. And i tell you what, Bill, you come on out. Really? I said, yes, sir. You're my special guest tonight. I said, my daughter going to make you peanut butter pie. It's unbelievable. I said, you come over to my house. He said, really? You? I said, yes, sir. And when we're done with the eating, we're going to do a Bible study. Now, I, 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 preacher, you simmer down now. Now, preacher, I never asked for no Bible. Now, preacher, there's no reason for you to say those things. Preacher, I didn't ask for no Bible study. Do you know what just happened? I planted, and he picked. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you, but seeing that you put it off from yourselves. You judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Brethren, it is not our job to pick. It is our job to plant. It's a lesson you should have learned when you were five years old. But for some reason, we have forgotten it. And we have become experts at picking. The scriptures divide the honest heart from the dishonest heart, not you. That is not your job. Your job is to teach it to everyone. I want you to look at these three things with me tonight. There's three lessons I've taught, real simple. Number one, defer, don't debate. Do not get into back and forth. If you do, the study is over. Why would they study with you if you answer all their questions? Don't do it. Oh, but preacher, the Bible says we should sanctify the Lord thy God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer. That is not what that means. Number two, you better show them. Do not tell them. You let them read the word of God because that's where the power is at. Number three, you plan it. You plan it to your neighbor, your coworker, your ball team member. You plan to everybody you know. Stop picking. Plant the word of God. I was at Paul Sing the pulpit. And uh, one of the members where I used to preach came up to me. This is not Will Let. I'm not going to tell you where. Because I'm not here to embarrass. He came up to me. He said, hey, he said, hey, Rob, he, says, uh, he said, uh, I need to ask you a question. He said, uh, have you ever heard of conversational evangelism? I don't know what that is. He said, well, he says, he said, we got a new preacher here, and he's teaching the church. He says uh, that Bible studies don't work. News to me. He said, yeah. He said, you know, Generation X, Z, P, what are we in? Z, X, whatever it is. They don't like Bible study. I didn't know that. He says, and, 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 and what we need to do is go to the Internet Rooms, coffee shops, tea rooms. We need to go to the, you know, the, the, the ball fields and just have good old conversations about the Lord. And then we invite them to church. I said, well, what happens next? He said, well, they hear a sermon and yeah, they'll come forward to be baptized. I said, well, I don't want to, I, don't, I never want to speak negatively about, you know, a, a man's work. I said, brother, I said, how many baptisms have you had since I left? Rob, we haven't baptized anyone.
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise as simple. What people need are Bible studies. Brethren, we don't need to have another conversation with people. What they need is to read the Word of God. I'll end with this. When he told me his story, I asked him, I said, would you let me share it with with people? Because everybody needs to hear this. I think most of you can relate to him tonight. He said, I had little interest in the church during my teenage years. I grew up in a home and really didn't go to church very often. It wasn't until I joined the Navy at the age of 19, I realized there's something missing in my life. I began to search for the church of the Bible. I visited different denominations. I finally decided one morning that I was going to visit the local church of Christ where I was based, based at a naval station in Maryland. I had little interest in the church at that time. Um, I didn't realize that uh, my, my brother Terry, he was actually pursuing the ministry in the church of Christ. So one Sunday morning, I decided to take a taxi to the nearby uh, uh, church of Christ at the, in at Lexington Park, Maryland. I was immediately surrounded as they showered me with attention, and they, they insisted on inviting me out to eat. They, they, they invited me to their homes. They were very, very nice. They, they took me back and forth to church from that day forward. Now, as they were providing me transportation, I, I had a friend. He was a member of that church. He became aware that I was not a Christian. He discouraged me from taking communion. The members there continued to be very hospitable. They kept inviting me into their home. It wasn't long for their preacher, Frank Starling, invited me into this home. And um, we sat down, and I believe it was the Jewel Miller film strip study. He brought them out, and we watched them together. It wasn't long before I, I could see that I'm in the church that the Bible teaches. I decided I'd be baptized on May 16, 1965. Say, preacher, why are you even telling me this story? Because that person is Gary Whitaker. And that's my dad. Brother, I want to ask you tonight, if it wasn't for Frank Starling on May 16, 1965, doing a Bible study with my father, where would I be? Because of that one Bible study, my dad decides that he's going to marry a Christian. So he, 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 he starts driving around Ohio after Vietnam. He's looking for a wife. He comes to the Church of Christ in Vermilion, Ohio. He, he meets the preacher's daughter. Her name's Kathy. It wasn't long before my grandfather said, what are your intentions to my daughter that got married? They moved to Bettsville, Ohio, and they had me. Because of that one Bible study... I'm going to grow up and I'm going to become a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, my sister, Christina, she's going to be born. She's going to grow up and she's going to become a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, I'm going to also do what my dad did. I'm going to look for a Christian. I found her in Nashville, Tennessee. Her name's Nicole. Because of that one Bible study, I marry Nicole and I have two children. Because of that one Bible study, my sister is going to do the same thing. She goes to Freed Hardman. She finds a husband. His name's Joey. Joey Barkley, they get married, they have two children. Because of that one Bible study, my oldest daughter grows up Hannah, and she becomes a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, my son grows up, and he becomes a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, my my sister's daughters, they grow up, Michaela, she becomes a Christian. Maddie, she grows up, and she becomes a Christian. All because of one Bible study. Brethren, I'm not asking you tonight to change the world. I'm not asking you to convert the entire city of Jackson, Mississippi. I'm asking you tonight to do one Bible study. Can you just do one? Do you know what the devil's greatest fear is tonight? His greatest fear is that you just might get this. Because he knows if this church gets this message, if you learn and you determine, and you become focused like a laser beam on this mission, he can't win. 
The only way he wins is to keep you in these pews. The only way he wins is to convince you this doesn't work. Yeah, go to New Zealand. That's great. Go to Africa. Go to India. Just don't do it here because it doesn't work. I pray God tonight that my brethren will get as excited about evangelism. Brethren, we get as excited about winning souls. We get as worked up about how to reach the lost as we did about the presidential election last year. Can you imagine what we could do? Can you imagine if brethren would talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and the lost as much as we talked about Donald Trump? I've got news for you tonight, brethren. We will not win a spiritual war fighting political battles. We are not going to turn this country around at the ballot box. If we want to save America, may I suggest what we need to do is do Bible studies. May I suggest what we need to do at the local church of Christ is engage the enemy. Brethren, there are sinners in our lives and they need the gospel and you're the one they're counting on. Gary can't do it all for you. Derek can't do it all for you. The elders can't do it all for you. Your youth minister can't do it all for you. We have got to engage the pews and get busy doing Bible studies. We have got to engage the church. Come back tomorrow. I'll give you four more principles. The whole purpose of this seminar is to awaken the evangelistic spirit that's asleep in these pews. Because there is no one that does it better than you. The devil can't win if you'll do it. Thank you for being here tonight. This book is called Fishing for Men. I didn't write it. I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. I'm here, brethren, to teach you what works. Bobby Bates was one of the greatest evangelists of his lifetime. In the last century, what he did was incredible. He wrote back to the Bible. I didn't write it. I don't need to write new evangelism material. Brethren, I need to train people how to use the stuff that works. I would highly recommend that you get this book. It has tools. It needs to go in your tackle box. I want you to fill your tackle box up while I'm here. I want you to get the training you need to go out fishing. Fishing that's far more important than any other kind of fishing that you've ever done. I want to train you how to fish for men. And we'll give you all the equipment you need to do it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be together tonight. We're thankful, Father, for the master evangelist. Father, for the principles he taught us. And Father, we pray that we would take those things. Father, that we would use them we would reach out to this community. I pray for this church tonight, Father. Pray for Gary. Pray for the eldership, the preachers. Father, we pray for every member. We pray, Father, that the spirit of evangelism would arise. And Father, that this church would regain a fervency of spirit. And they would take the gospel of Christ with strategy and strategically target sinners. Father, with the energy of every member, with the power of the gospel through the entire church, they'd reach the lost. Thank you for everyone tonight, for all the visitors. Bring us back tomorrow night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll be dismissed.